may be seated and let's turn to Mark chapter 3. At the end of chapter 2, we found Jesus being challenged by the Pharisees because his disciples were picking and eating the wheat on the Sabbath day. And they wondered and challenged him as why he allowed his disciples to violate the Sabbath day law. Jesus showed that there was no violation of the law, that the Sabbath day was made for man. It is important that you have a day that is a day of rest. Six days shalt thou labor and do thy work, but the seventh day, a day of rest. And it was made for man, it's important that you have a day when you just sort of kick back and rest. You don't uh, do the normal routine, but you have a time of, of just relaxing and resting. God made it for man. He knows that we need it. You can't just keep going day after day after day. Uh, life would become very boring. And so Jesus pointed out that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But this upset them. So perhaps they set this up. The third chapter, it, it follows the, the uh, challenging by the Pharisees concerning the Sabbath day. But he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. Some of them believe, or some believe, some of the commentators believe that this was a setup that they knew Jesus was going to be in the synagogue and they set that man there with a withered hand in order that they might find fault, they might accuse him. They knew that Jesus could not really stand to see a human blight. They knew that whenever Jesus would come against uh, or come up against a human blight, that he would want to help, he would want to do something about it. Now, I do believe that um, all sickness, all disease, uh, all of these infirmities that man experiences result from the fact that sin entered the world. Now, I don't believe that there is a direct sin sickness relationship. In some instances, there are. But I do believe that all result from the fact that sin entered the world. I don't think that it was a part of original creation. I don't think that it would happen if Adam had not sinned. I believe that God made his body perfect in every respect, and that God warned him uh, that if he would eat of that tree, uh, that he would surely die, that it would bring uh, detrimental effects. It would destroy man. And uh, the aging process, all of this, I believe, resulted from sin and the entrance of sin into the world. Now, Jesus came to redeem the world from sin and from the effects of sin. And thus, whenever he came across someone who was suffering from the effects of the fact that this is a sinful world, he did what was necessary to deliver that person from the blight which sin causes. In this case, the man had a withered hand, and uh, they watched him, that is, the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes always took the, the most important seats in the synagogue. In the synagogue, of course, the women were on one side, the men on the other, but down in the front were the Pharisees and the scribes. 
and their duty was to watch to make sure that everyone crossed the T's and dotted the I's and to make sure that, you know, the, the law was being kept and nothing was done out of order. And, and thus they were there watching Jesus to see what he would do when he entered the synagogue on that Sabbath day in order that they might accuse him. And he said to the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. As Jesus entered, there was no doubt the tension that really began to build because they were anticipating this sort of uh, conflict. Let's say that you are a traveler. You're, you're, you're going from Damascus to Jerusalem. And as you're going from Damascus to Jerusalem, you pass through the city of Capernaum, which is on the route uh, from Damascus to Jerusalem. And let's say that you arrived on Friday afternoon. And so you were going to spend the night there in Capernaum. And on the Sabbath, Saturday morning, you went on into the uh, synagogue to worship. And you look around the synagogue and you see the people that have assembled, uh, the scriptures that are read, and you see the Pharisees down there, and you happen to notice this man over there, and you notice that his hand is, is withered. It's just hanging there, and it, it just he doesn't have any control of it. And, and you might wonder, how does he dress himself with, with his hand like that? And you might sort of wonder how, how it would affect you if you didn't have the use of, uh, of a hand or your arm. And suddenly, you feel a tension. You look around. You wonder what's going on. And over in the doorway, you see this man standing, and you see these Pharisees as they look at this man who is standing there, and they're looking back at this man who has a withered hand. And you wonder, what is the relationship between the man in the doorway and this man with a withered hand? There's, there's something going on here. And then you hear the man standing there in the door, speak to the man with a withered hand and say, stand up. And tension now really begins to mount. And you hear him ask a question. On the Sabbath day, is it right to do something that is good or to do something that is evil? And you think, what kind of a question is that? It surely should be right to do something good. It never is right to do something evil. What's he talking about? He asked a second question. Is it right to kill a man or to heal a man? And again, you think to yourself, well, never right to kill anybody, but just because it's the Sabbath day, it seems to me it should be right to heal. And then he says to the man with the withered hand, stretch forth your hand. Now, at this point, you're ready to jump up. You're ready to say, wait a minute. Why are you saying that? Are you trying to make fun of this man who has a uh, disability? Are you drawing people's attention to this man's blight? What's wrong with you? If he could stretch forth your hand, don't you know he would do it? And as you're ready to jump up and interject your thoughts, Suddenly, you're amazed because you watch this man as he stretches forth his hand. It's an interesting thing. 
When Jesus said, stretch forth your hand, it was an impossible thing for the man to do. He could have said to the Lord, you know, I'd love to. Oh, you don't know how I'd love to stretch forth my hand. But after my stroke, I just haven't had any use of, of, of my hand or my arm. It just hangs. I, I've tried, and, and I, just, I just can't do it. Or this man could will to obey the command of Jesus. And his willingness to obey the command, he discovered that all that was necessary to obey was given to him in that moment. Jesus often comes to us in that area of blight in our lives, maybe not a withered hand, but maybe a withered soul. Maybe it is a problem that you're having with an addiction. Maybe it is a problem that you're having with uh, depression. Maybe a problem with what we would call a besetting sin. And Jesus is saying to you, be free. Live in victory. And we're so prone to just tell the Lord all of the reasons why we can't, how we would love to, how hard we have tried, how often we have failed. But if we will to obey his command, we will discover that all that is necessary to obey will be given to us. This man made that discovery, and you can make that discovery tonight. Whatever it is in your life that is keeping you back from living a life of victory in Jesus Christ, he's addressing that blight in your life. And he's telling you, be free, be delivered, be strong, stretch forth your hand. So he stretched it out. His hand was restored whole as the other. This caused the Pharisees to say, we've got to get rid of him. It was over the Sabbath day, and the uh, regulations that they had placed on the Sabbath day that caused the real breach with Jesus and their determination to put him to death. So the Pharisees went forth immediately, and they took counsel with the Herodians against Jesus how they might destroy him. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea. So Mark is now going to give us some insight into the ministry of Christ. He's not ready at this point to face the issues with the Pharisees. That will come. Uh, but now he sort of uh, goes into the uh, deserted areas. People will follow him uh, to be healed and to be touched. And Mark will tell us how multitudes of people were being touched by Jesus Christ and how the crowds were just pressing against him, reaching out to touch him because as many as would touch him would be healed of whatever plague that they had. So can you imagine how they would be pushing, shoving, crowding to get to the front, uh, to get close to Jesus, close enough to touch him? And so it, Wherever he would go, it would create sort of a, a mob kind of a situation as people were pressing against him and against those that were around him, trying to get close enough to touch. So the multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea, from Jerusalem, from Idumea, clear on down uh, to the area of south of the Dead Sea, from beyond Jordan, that is over on the other side of the Jordan River, and even those from Tyre and Sidon, 
uh, coming over uh, to the area where Jesus was from all over the country. As you look at these various names, you realize from all over they were coming to Jesus. Now, John doesn't record all of the healings. He just tells us that multitudes were healed. He does pick out a few special healings and sort of showcases them. But just a small, small percentage of the multitudes of people that were healed are recorded in the Gospels. In fact, you remember John, as he concluded his Gospel, he said, if all of the things that Jesus did were written, I suppose that all of the libraries in the world could not contain the books that could be written uh, of, of the ministry of Jesus, the things that were wrought through his ministry. So uh, we read here in verse 9 that he spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. Uh, it was getting too difficult. Uh, people were getting too pushy. And so to sort of protect himself from just the crowd coming and pushing him and, and creating a disorderly kind of a situation, he told them to get a little boat and uh, to just push out a little ways from the shore. And there from the boat, he could teach the people that had gathered on the shore, and uh, it was a, a thing of just being able to get his message out uh, without the interruption of the crowds pushing and shoving against him. And so he healed many, insomuch that they pressed upon him to touch him, and as many as had plagues. Unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him, and they cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. And he straightly charged them that they should not make him known. Not ready to be revealed as the Messiah. He was very interested in timing. There was the time that would come when he would be revealed as the Messiah or present himself to the nation as their Messiah. He didn't want to do it prematurely. There was a day, a special day, that was already set by God, the day in which he would be presented as the Messiah to the nation. That day would be related to the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. For Daniel wrote, from the time the commandment goes forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem under the coming of the Messiah the Prince would be 70 sevens, or actually 69 sevens, uh, and seven sevens and 63 sevens, no, 62 sevens and seven sevens, and 300 and, uh, oh boy. <laughs> Get this one straight now. A thousand three hundred and a thousand eight hundred. Whoa. Oh my. Senior moments. They're tough. Uh, <laughs> but it'll come through. Four hundred and six eighty three years from the time the commandment would go forth. It would be 172,880 days from the time the commandment would go forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That commandment went forth in Nehemiah chapter 2 uh, in the reign of Artaxerxes. And uh, it is actually the first day of the month of Nisan in uh, the reign of Artaxerxes, and I think it was the 15th year of his reign. In 445 B.C., the commandment went forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and uh, 173,880, 172,883 80 days later, Jesus made his entry into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. So this was timing. It was something that Jesus didn't want a premature 
effort to reveal him as the Messiah or to acclaim him as the Messiah in a public way, but was waiting for this day in which he would enter into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey, presenting himself as their king, as their Messiah. So uh, he, he, that is why he would command the demons not to speak, not to reveal that he was indeed the Son of God. So he went to a mountain, and he called unto him those that he would, and they came to him. Now, it is important to know that there were many, many disciples who were following Jesus. They could have numbered around 100 or more disciples who were following Jesus. When Jesus died, and rose again and ascended into heaven, the church met. And Peter said, it's important that we get someone to take the place of Judas. And so he said, we need someone who has been with us from the beginning, who has can bear witness with us of the resurrection. So a person that had been around from the beginning of the ministry of Jesus when he was baptized, one of the many who were there and was able to bear witness that he saw Jesus who was resurrected. So there were many to choose from and uh, they came down to Matthias and Barsabas and, uh, it, but there were many, many disciples, but there were 12 that he chose to be apostles. And so this is a listing of the 12. Now, the word apostle means one who is sent out. So he called unto him, those who he would, they came to him, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him, that he might send them forth to preach. Send them forth. Apostle means sent forth or one who is sent forth, and to have power to heal the sicknesses, to cast out devils. And Simon, he surnamed Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, he surnamed them Bonerges, which is the sons of thunder. Probably because when a certain Samaritan city closed its doors to Jesus as they were traveling from Jerusalem to Galilee, James and John said, shall we call down fire from heaven and consume them? And, and so he calls them sons of thunder. They were the kind of guys that are ready to take action if someone is opposing the Lord and uh, they're the fiery kind and uh, ready to really, you know, call down fire and, and destroy them. And Jesus said, you don't understand what sort you are. You're not calling down fire, you know. And uh, it, it isn't something that, you know, we are to try to defend the, the Lord or to defend uh, the kingdom of heaven or to defend the Bible. Uh, God is perfectly capable of defending himself. And... Uh, Actually, if you try to defend yourself, he'll let you, uh, but you have a very poor defense. <laughs> Better that you let the Lord defend you. You know, uh, there are all these uh, things that are being said and go on and on and, and say, are you going to answer that? Are you going to do something about it? Yeah, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to pray and let the Lord take care of it. And they're going to have a rougher time trying to deal with the Lord than they would ever have dealing with me. So... Uh, you just let the Lord defend you, and he will. So uh, sent them forth to preach, gave them power over sicknesses, power to cast out devils. And the names of them, uh, Andrew uh, was, of course, the brother of Peter, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, known as James the Less, Thaddeus, and uh, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, 
and they went into a house. And the multitude, now remember there are multitudes that are following him. They come together so that they could not so much as eat bread. They were pressing him so much that they really didn't have time to stop to eat. Uh, the, the pressures of the people coming to be ministered to. And when his friends heard of it, and, and this would indicate his family, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said, he is beside himself. Now, that's a, a, a way of saying he is crazy. A person who is beside themselves would be a person with a split personality and manifested when a person talks to himself and answers himself. Now, you may talk to yourself, but when you start answering yourself, then you're in trouble. <laughs> you know, oftentimes they say, Chuck, why did you do that? Well, I did it. Well, be careful, you're in problem now when you start to answer yourself. So uh, it, it, they said he's beside himself. That is, he's talking to himself. And uh, they're going to rescue him. And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and it is by the prince of devils that he cast out devils. So he called them unto him. He said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. So if Satan rises up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. Now no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods unless he will first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men and blasphemies wherewith so ever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Spirit has never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. It was because they said he has an unclean spirit. Attributing the works of the Holy Spirit unto Satan caused Jesus to warn them of an unpardonable sin. What is the unpardonable sin? The continual rejection of the witness of the Holy Spirit to your heart that you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Because God has provided only one means whereby we can be saved. As Peter faced the Sanhedrin, he said, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The cross of Jesus Christ tells you there's only one way that we can be saved. Because Jesus before the cross was praying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. If what is possible? If salvation from sin is possible, by a person being good, by a person being sincere, by a person keeping certain rules, by a person uh, being religious, then Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. But the very fact that he went to the cross declares that there is only one way that God has provided for the forgiveness of sins. And that's through faith in Jesus Christ and the fact that he died for your sins. And you're putting your trust in him. God honors that faith and accounts you as righteous. But there is no other way for you to have a standing before God. So naturally, the Holy Spirit testifying to you that you need to surrender your life to Jesus Christ 
if you continue to reject that testimony of the Holy Spirit. As you are facing indisputable evidence that Jesus is the Son of God, that he did fulfill all of the predictions in the Old Testament concerning his first coming, and to reject the truth, you will have to one day give some kind of an explanation concerning Jesus. How is it that he could do the things he did? How is it that he had such power? How is it that so many people were healed of so many different maladies? Now, they had rejected the fact that he was the Messiah. And they were continuing to reject that fact. So much so when he gave evidence that he was the Messiah. Indisputable evidence by the many people that were being healed, they had to attribute it to something. And so they attributed it that he's doing it by the power of Satan. But as Jesus again points out, that's irrational. If Satan is casting out Satan, then his kingdom is divided. His kingdom is going to fall. Uh, any kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And so uh, Jesus is uh, showing how irrational is their conclusion. And it is showing, however, that they are getting very close to that place of saying no to Jesus one too many times. There is a line we know not where, a time we know not when, that marks the destiny of men twixt sorrow and despair. There is a line, though by man unseen, once it has been crossed, God himself and all his love has sworn that all is lost. They're getting close, Jesus is warning them, because when they start attributing the works of the Holy Spirit, which are evidence that he is the Son of God, and they twist it and say he's doing it by the power of the devil, that's getting close to the rejection fully of Jesus Christ. Now there came then his brothers and his mother. As we get to chapter 6 next week, uh, we'll get into this. Uh, Jesus did have brothers and sisters and uh, they're, they are even named for us in chapter 6. So his brothers and his mother, and they were standing outside, and they sent unto him, calling him. And the multitudes sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, your mother and your brothers are outside, and they're looking for you. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked round on those that were sitting about him, and he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. Which brings up in my mind a certain difficulty with a Hail Mary, full of grace. Pray for us sinners in this our hour of death. And praying to Mary to intercede for you. I would hate to depend upon Mary's intercession. Lest Jesus would say, your mother wants to talk to you <laughs> about Chuck and his problems. <laughs> and he said, who is my mother? <laughs> I mean, if he, if he said it once, uh, chances are he might say it again. We can go directly to Jesus. The Bible tells us that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and that's the man Christ Jesus. We don't have to go to his mother. And there is no indication in the scripture that going to his mother will get us to Jesus that she is an intermediator uh, or inter 
intermediator uh, between uh, Jesus and us, that she can stand between us and represent us. So I uh, have a problem with that. Chapter 4. He began again to teach by the seaside. There was gathered unto him a great multitude, and now the multitudes, wherever he goes, attracting the multitudes, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea, and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables, and said unto them in his doctrine, Listen to me. Behold, there went out a sower to sow, and it came to pass, as he was sowing, some of the seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, but because it had no depth of earth, when the sun was up and it was scorched, because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among thorns, the thorns grew up and choked it. It yielded no fruit. Now other fell on good ground. It did yield fruit that sprang up and increased, and it brought forth some 30, some 60, some 100. And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him, concerning the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto those that are without, all of these things are done in parables, that seeing they might see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven. A lot of times we hear criticism of mass evangelistic campaigns, such as those that are being held by Billy Graham and by the Harvest Crusades with Greg Laurie. And as we are there and Greg gives the invitation, we see hundreds upon hundreds of people come out of the stands and go out and stand in the field and Greg leads them in the sinner's prayer. But the criticism that we often hear is, but so many of those people who go forward never go beyond that. They don't get locked into a church. They don't grow in their walk with the Lord. They just continue in the old style of living uh, that they lived before uh, the crusade. And, and so the criticism is that it doesn't really take with a lot of people. Well, we should expect that. Rather than criticize it, Jesus sort of gives here a parable that sort of would indicate that maybe one in four it takes. Uh, there are the four different types of soil. Uh, the, uh, so that it would be impractical, impractical to think that everyone that goes forward is genuinely converted. They may be touched emotionally. Uh, they may be touched uh, by other motivating things. It may be that as so many people are going forward, they are just uh, moved with the crowd. It could be that because the crowd is applauding those that are going forward, uh, they're gaining attention by it, but it isn't really a genuine conversion. So Jesus begins at this point teaching by parables. Now, the reason why you use parables is that people are no longer really listening to the teaching. The truth is going over their heads. Many people were there for wrong motives. They were wanting healing. 
They didn't really want Jesus necessarily, but they wanted healing. And there are many people today who want benefits, but they really don't want to submit their lives to the Lord. And because they were not listening, he adopts the teaching by parables. Now, people are always interested in stories. And when a person is a public speaker and he feels that he's losing the crowd, he'll always tell a story because people perk up. You know, one time I was traveling uh, across the country to Arizona, <laughs> and, and you see, oh, Arizona? Where in Arizona? You know, and it, it, you know, people pick up. And so you use it, but Jesus was using these stories to illustrate the truth. And so by the time the story is through, those who had insight caught the truth. To others, it was just an interesting story. But it was, the purpose was to illustrate and to drive home a truth. So, he said unto them, that is, his disciples who had come to him, do you not know this parable? How then will you know all parables? The sower is sowing the word, that is, the seed is the word of God. Now, what do we know about seed? A seed. We know that in the seed, there is encapsulated the DNA formula with all of the information and the potential to produce a clone, a replica of that seed. There's potential. The pe potential to reproduce. So I plant a peach seed in the ground. I water it. Pretty soon there's a little green shoot that comes up. Grows up into a peach tree and in a few years, I'm eating peaches from the seed that I planted. But in that seed was the DNA formula, the information to produce a peach tree that would produce peaches, uh, Babcock peaches, that's what I like, uh, with the white flesh and all. And so I'm enjoying now the, the fruit from the seed that was planted with the information of the reproducing of the original tree from which the seed came, or the fruit from which the seed came. God designed it that way. You remember he said uh, that, uh, that the seeds should reproduce after themselves and so forth, and it was so. Tremendously interesting to me, the potential uh, the DNA formula that's in the seed to produce the tree, the type of leaves, the type of fruit, and, and all, it's all there encoded. The Word of God is the seed that is planted. The interesting thing about the Word of God, planted in your heart, there is encoded in it the DNA formula to reproduce Christ in you. It's his word planted in your heart, that power of reproducing Christ in you. And that to me is quite exciting. So the sower is sowing the word. Now these are they that are by the wayside where the word is sown but when they have heard it, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So a person hears the word, but it has no effect upon them at all. Immediately, Satan just 
rips it off, and they don't give it any consideration, it doesn't go any further than that. They've heard it, but they just reject it as Satan rips the word away. Now, Satan is represented by the birds. The fowls of the air come and they eat it. Likewise, those which are sown on the stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. You, you see them just smiling after they've said the sinner's prayer and, and they've received the word with gladness, but they have no root in themselves. And so they endure, but only for a time and afterward when affliction or persecution shall come for the word's sake, immediately they're offended. So those that receive are excited, but there's no depth. They don't go any further. It's like a, a plant that is planted on uh, rocky soil. Because of the rocky soil, the warmth of the rock, it's the first little plants that spring up in the spring over there. Now, it is interesting, it's a very rocky land over there, and uh, you'd have to really see it to understand uh, this particular part of the parable. Not just rocks in the field, uh, it's just a stone, big rock, but in the rock there are little holes, and in these little holes in the rock or uh, indentations, there's, there's soil. So you find this bare rock, but with little pockets of soil uh, that are there in the rock. Now, over there in the early part of February, middle of February, in these areas of the rock where the soil is only an inch or so deep, it is the first place that begins to green out after the winter rains. You'll see these little flowers that are coming up in these little patches and sometimes no more than two or three feet uh, in, in length and width. And these little patches of green grass and little, patch, little flowers and so forth that are there. But they are the first to spring up because of the warmth of the rock. But as the summer develops, it's the first to die because there's no depth for the roots, there's no moisture, and they dry out, and it's the first area where it dies. And so, uh, as Jesus is illustrating, they understood, I mean, they knew the territory and how that, uh, these little patches of earth in, this, in these rocks uh, would spring up quickly, but no depth, thus they died no root within themselves. They endure only for a little time. Then they which are sown among the thorns are such as hear the word, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire of other things entering in choke the word, it becomes unfruitful. Tragically, I do believe that the church has a large portion of those that are classified as being sown among thorns. They've received the word, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the busyness of just making a living, they do not give the time necessary in their walk with the Lord to really bear fruit for Jesus Christ. And, and I'm afraid that there's a large percentage of people within the church that would fit this particular category where the fruit doesn't come forth because it is choked out by the interest of other things in our lives. 
So these are they which are sown on the good ground, such as they hear the word, they receive it, and they bring forth fruit. 30, 60, some even a hundredfold. Take a look at your life. Is there really fruit coming forth from your life? Would you say 30, maybe 60, perhaps even a hundredfold? Our life should be bearing fruit. 30, 60, 100 fold. You remember in Jesus saying, I'm the true vine, my father's husband, and every branch in me that beareth fruit, he cleanses it that it might bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Abide in me and my word, let it abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, neither more can you unless you abide in me. Abide in me, let my word abide in you, and you will bring forth much fruit. The Lord wants our lives to bring forth fruit. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, then he cuts it off. And they are gathered together and cast into the fire and burned. The importance of, of looking at my life and asking, is my life really bearing fruit for the kingdom of God? Or are there other things that just take up my time, my energy, and, and also that my fruit bearing is really choked out? Then he said unto them, is a candle brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not to be set on a candlestick. There is nothing which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret that it should come abroad. If any man has ears to hear, let him hear. So he sort of begins his section and ends it by saying, if you have ears to hear, listen, pay attention. <coughs> The candle is intended to give light. You're intended to give light to the world around you. The candle isn't brought in to be put under a bushel, but to give light to the house. And he said unto them, take heed what you hear, for with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And unto you that hear shall more be given. For he that hath to him, it shall be given. He that hath not from him shall be taken even that which he has. We'll get that in another parable. Uh, now, here is a basic important truth. With the same measure that you use to meet out, that is the measure that will be used by God to give back to you. If you sow sparingly, the Bible said, you will reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you will be, reap bountifully for in whatever, and he, he says it again in this place, whatever measure you use to meet it out, that's the measure that God is going to use to meet it back to you. Put it to the test. And he said, so is the kingdom of God. If a man should cast seed into the ground, he should sleep, rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, he knoweth not how. For the earth brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he puts in the sickle, because the harvest is come. The kingdom of God, how it grows and all. We plant the seed. And we continue to just plant the seed. Paul said, one plants, one waters, God gives the increase. How does it grow? How does it develop in your life? How is the fruit brought forth? 
And, and he describes how, first of all, there's the blade and then the stalk and then the ear of corn on the stalk and then the harvesting, the, the, the harvesting of the fruit. It, it's sort of a mystery, a process that is hard to really understand. Uh, it, it's just the way it happens. And uh, it's, it's the unconscious growth that takes place as the result of the seed being planted on fertile soil. And so he said, where unto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or what comparisons can we compare it to? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth, it is less than all of the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all of the herbs, and it shoots out great branches so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. And with many such parables spake he the word unto them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable he did not speak to them, and when they were alone he expounded all of these things to his disciples. Now this particular parable of the mustard seed, the kingdom of God, or the church. Mustard seeds do not grow into trees. That's abnormal growth. If a mustard seed would grow into a tree, that would be abnormal growth. And oftentimes within the church you see abnormal growth, like a mustard seed growing into a tree. That would be abnormal. Notice the fowls come and lodge in the branches. Now, there is what is known as expositional constancy. In the parables, if in a parable a fowl or a bird is something that is evil, and of course in the parable of the sower, the fowls eating up the seed that it doesn't have a chance to take root, and it was Satan, then if the fowls of the air are coming and lodging in the branches, it is speaking really of an evil element that is coming into the church. The church with abnormal growth, but with evil influences within it. And as you look at church history, and as you look at the church today across America, there are so many so-called churches that are denying the Word of God as the Word of God. They are denying the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. They are denying the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're denying the miracles of Jesus Christ. And, and yet, uh, of course, look at how many lesbians and homosexuals are taking major positions within the church today. These are birds that are lodging in the branches and finding shadow underneath. The abnormal growth, but it is definitely not of the Lord. So, the same day when the evening had come, he said to them, now notice carefully, let us pass over unto the other side. Multitudes are there. Let's get away. Let's pass over in the evening. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full of water. And he was in the back part of the ship asleep on a pillow. He must have been very, very tired to be able to sleep in a storm like this, where the boat is filling up with water and it, it, he was probably at a point of exhaustion, just sleeping in the back part of the ship there on a pillow. And they woke him, 
And they said unto him, Master, don't you care that we perish? And he arose and he rebuked the wind. And he said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. The wind stopped, and the water became glassy immediately. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now he's just rebuked the wind. Now he's rebuking the disciples. You woke me up. <laughs> How is it that you have no faith? It's because they didn't pay attention when they left. Notice, he said to them, let us pass over unto the other side. He didn't say, let's go under. <laughs> if Jesus says, let's pass over, there's no way you're going to go under. And, and so they were afraid they were going to go under. You can't, because you have the word of Jesus, let's pass over to the other side. And they just weren't paying attention. And so they feared exceedingly. They said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? More than a man, the Son of God, exercising the powers of God, our Lord, our Savior. Father, we're so grateful for the work of Jesus Christ in helping and in healing those who have been affected by sin. And Lord, we thank you for the power of Jesus, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, we thank you that you did impart unto your disciples that power that they should go forth and heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead. And we ask, Lord, that tonight, even as you are here with us, we thank you for being here with us, Lord. And as you are here, there are those who need your touch this evening. There are those, Lord, that have withered areas in their life. There are those who have physical infirmities. There are those, Lord, who have been taken captive by the enemy and they are addicted. and cannot free themselves. But Lord, you came to set the captive free. And so we pray tonight, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will minister to the needs of the people and those who are lame spiritually might become whole. Those whose Lives are being <coughs> choked out as far as bearing fruit. Lord, turn them from the concern with the things of the world and help us, Lord, to become more concerned with the things of the Spirit and how we can best serve you work, Lord, in each of our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front to minister to you tonight who need a touch of the Lord in your life. The Lord wants to minister to you 
He is able. He is willing. And so we would encourage you, as we're dismissed, come on down and let these men pray for you that you might receive the Lord's touch in your life, no matter what the situation or the condition might be, that you might be helped by him this evening because he wants to help you. And so take advantage. Spend some time in prayer before you go home. Seek the Lord. And don't let the cares of this life or the deceitfulness of riches or the desire of other things choke out the fruitfulness that God wants to bring forth in your life and through your life. May the Lord be with you this week. May you have a blessed week. As you experience the work of God's Spirit in your life, as he continues to conform us more and more each day into the image of Jesus our Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. O oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. God bless you.